Section 5 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 5. Loss of the Brig Tyrell. In addition to the many dreadful shipwrecks already narrated, the following, which is a circumstantial account given by T. Purnell, chief mate of the brig Tyrell, Arthur Cochlin, commander, and the only person among the whole crew who had the good fortune to escape, claims our particular attention. On Saturday, June twenty ninth, 1759, they sailed from New York to Sandy Hook, and there came to an anchor, waiting for the captain's coming down with a new boat and some other articles. Accordingly, he came on board early the succeeding morning, and the boat cleared, hoisted in, stowed, and lashed. At eight o'clock a.m. they weighed anchor, sailed out of Sandy Hook, and the same day at noon took their departure from the high land never sunk, and proceeded on their passage to Antigua. As soon as they made sail, the captain ordered the boat to be cast loose, in order that she might be painted, with the oars, rudder, and tiller which job he, Captain Cochlin, undertook to do himself. At four p.m. they found the vessel made a little more water than usual, but as it did not cause much additional labor at the pump, nothing was thought of it. At eight the leak did not seem to increase. At twelve it began to blow very hard in squalls, which caused the vessel to lie down very much, whereby it was apprehended she wanted more ballast. Thereupon the captain came on deck, being the starboard watch, and close reefed both topsails. At four a.m. the weather moderated, let out both reefs, at eight it became still more moderate, and they made more sail, and set top gallant sails. The weather was still thick and hazy. There was no further observation taken at present except that the vessel made more water. The captain was now chiefly employed in painting the boat, oars, rudder, and tiller. On Monday, June 30th, at 4 p.m., the wind was at east-northeast, freshened very much, and blew so very hard as occasioned the brig to lie along in such a manner as caused general alarm. The captain was now earnestly entreated to put for New York, or steer for the Capes of Virginia. At 8, took in top-gallant sail, and close reefed both topsails, still making more water. Afterwards, the weather became still more moderate and fair, and they made more sail. July 1st, at 4 a.m., it began to blow in squalls very hard, took in one reef in each topsail, and continued so until 8 a.m., the weather being still thick and hazy. No observation. The next day she made still more water, but as every watch pumped it out, this was little regarded. At 4 p.m., took second reef in each topsail, close reefed both, and sent down the top gallant yard, the gale still increasing. At 4 a.m. the wind got round to north, and there was no appearance of its abating. At 8 the captain, well satisfied that she was very crank and ought to have had more ballast, agreed to make for Bacon Island Road in North Carolina, and in the very act of wearing her, a sudden gust of wind laid her down on her beam end, and she never rose again. At this time Mr. Purnell was lying in the cabin with his clothes on, not having pulled them off since they left land. Having been rolled out of his bed on his chest, with great difficulty he reached the roundhouse door. The first salutation he met with was from the stepladder that went from the quarter-deck to the poop, which knocked him against the companion. A lucky circumstance for those below, as, by laying the ladder against the companion, it served both him and the rest of the people who were in the steerage as a conveyance to windward. Having transported the two after guns forward to bring her more by the head in order to make her hold a better wind, thus they got through the aftermost gun port on the quarter deck, and being all on her broadside, every movable rolled to leeward, and as the vessel overset, so did the boat and turned bottom upwards, her lashings being cast loose by order of the captain, and having no other prospect of saving their lives but by the boat. Purnell, with two others and the cabin boy, who were excellent swimmers, plunged into the water, and with difficulty righted her, when she was brim full, and washing with the water's edge. They then made fast the end of the main sheet to the ring in her stern post, 
and those who were in the fore chain sent down the end of the boom tackle to which they made fast the boat's painter and by which they lifted her a little out of the water so that she swam about two or three inches free but almost full they then put the cabin boy into her and gave him a bucket that happened to float by and he bailed away as quick as he could and soon after another person got in with another bucket and in short time got all the water out of her they then put two long oars that were stowed in the larboard quarter of the Tyrrell into the boat and pulled or rowed right to windward for as the wreck drifted she made a dreadful appearance in the water and mr purnell and two of the people put off from the wreck in search of the oars rudder and tiller after a long while they succeeded in picking them all up one after another they then returned to their wretched companions who were all overjoyed to see them having given them up for lost by this time night drew on very fast while they were rowing in the boat some small quantity of white biscuit mr purnell supposed about half a peck floated in a small cask out of the roundhouse but before it came to hand it was so soaked with salt water that it was almost in a fluid state and about double the quantity of common ship biscuit likewise floated which was in like manner soaked this was all the provision that they had not a drop of fresh water could they get neither could the carpenter get at any of his tools to scuttle her sides for could this have been accomplished they might have saved plenty of provisions and water by this time it was almost dark having got one compass it was determined to quit the wreck and take their chance in the boat which was nineteen feet six inches long and six feet four inches broad mr purnell supposes it was now about nine o'clock it was very dark they had run about three hundred sixty miles by their dead reckoning on a south-east by east course the number in the boat was seventeen in all the boat was very deep and little hopes were entertained of either seeing land or surviving long the wind got round to westward which was the course they wanted to steer but it began to blow and rain so very hard that they were obliged to keep before the wind and sea in order to preserve her above water soon after they had put off from the wreck the boat shipped two heavy seas one after another so that they were obliged to keep her before the wind and sea for had she shipped another sea she certainly would have swamped with them by sunrise the next morning july third they judged that they had been running east-south-east which was contrary to their wishes the wind dying away the weather became very moderate the compass which they had saved proved of no utility one of the people having trod upon and broken it it was accordingly thrown overboard they now proposed to make a sale of some frocks and trousers but they had got neither needles nor sewing twine one of the people however had a needle in his knife and another several fishing lines in his pockets which were unlaid by some and others were employed in ripping the frocks and trousers by sunset they had provided a tolerable lug sail having split one of the boat's thwarts which was of yellow deal with a very large knife which one of the crew had in his pocket they made a yard and lashed it together by the strands of the four top gallant halyards that were thrown into the boat promiscuously they also made a mast of one of the long oars and set their sails with sheets and tacks made out of the top gallant halyards their only guide was the north star they had a tolerable good breeze all night and the whole of the next day july the fourth the weather continued very moderate and the people were in as good a spirits as their dreadful situation would admit july fifth the wind and weather continued much the same and they knew by the north star that they were standing in for the land the next day mr purnell observed some of the men drinking salt water and seeming rather fatigued at this time they imagined the wind was got round to the southward and they steered as they thought by the north star to the northwest quarter but on the seventh they found the wind had got back to the northward and blew very fresh they got their oars out the greatest part of the night and the next day the wind still dying away the people labored alternately at the oars without distinction about noon the wind sprung up so that they laid in their oars and as they thought steered about north-northwest and continued so until about eight or nine in the morning of july the ninth when they all thought they were upon soundings by the coldness of the water they were in general in very good spirits the weather continued still thick and hazy and by the north star they found that they had been steering about north by west 
July 10th. The people had drank so much salt water that it came from them as clear as it was before they drank it, and Mr. Purnell perceived that the second mate had lost a considerable share of his strength and spirits, and also at noon that the carpenter was delirious, his malady increasing every hour. About dusk he had almost overset the boat by attempting to throw himself overboard and otherwise behaving quite violent. As his strength, however, failed him, he became more manageable, and they got him to lie down in the middle of the boat among some of the people. Mr. Purnell drank once a little salt water, but could not relish it. He preferred his own urine, which he drank occasionally as he made it. Soon after sunset the second mate lost his speech. Mr. Purnell desired him to lean his head on him. He died, without a groan or struggle, on the 11th of July, being the ninth day they were in the boat. In a few minutes after, the carpenter expired almost in a similar manner. These melancholy scenes rendered the situation of the survivors more dreadful. It is impossible to describe their feelings. Despair became general. Every man imagined his own dissolution was near. They now all went to prayers. Some prayed in the Welsh language, some in Irish, and others in English. Then, after a little deliberation, they stripped the two dead men and hove them overboard. The weather being now very mild and almost calm, they turned to, cleaned the boat, and resolved to make their sail larger out of the frocks and trousers of the two deceased men. Purnell got the captain to lie down with the rest of the people, the boatswain and one man excepted, who assisted him in making the sail larger, which they had completed by six or seven o'clock in the afternoon, having made a shroud out of the boat's painter, which served as a shifting backstay. Purnell also fixed his red flannel waistcoat at the masthead as a signal the most likely to be seen. Soon after this some of them observed a sloop at great distance coming as they thought from the land. This roused every man's spirits. They got out their oars at which they labored alternately, exerting all their remaining strength to come up with her. But night coming on and the sloop getting a fresh breeze of wind, they lost sight of her, which occasioned a general consternation. However, the appearance of the North Star which they kept on their starboard bow gave them hopes that they stood in for land. This night one William Wathing died. He was sixty-four years of age and had been to sea fifty years, quite worn out with fatigue and hunger. He earnestly prayed to the last moment for a drop of water to cool his tongue. Early the next morning Hugh Williams also died, and in the course of the day another of the crew, entirely exhausted, they both expired without a groan. Early in the morning of July 13th it began to blow very fresh, and increased so much that they were obliged to furl their sail and keep the boat before the wind and sea, which drove them off soundings. In the evening their gunner died. The weather now becoming moderate and the wind in the southwest quarter, they made sail, not one being able to row or pull an oar at any rate. They ran all this night with a fine breeze. The next morning, July 14th, two more of the crew died, and in the evening they also lost the same number. They found they were on soundings again, and concluded the wind had got round to the northwest quarter. They stood in for the land all this night, and early on July 12th two others died. The deceased were thrown overboard as soon as their breath had departed. The weather was now thick and hazy, and they were still certain they were on soundings. The cabin boy was seldom required to do anything, and as his intellects at this time were very good and his understanding clear, it was the opinion of Mr. Purnell that he would survive them all, but he prudently kept his thoughts to himself. The captain seemed likewise tolerably well and to have kept up his spirits. On account of the haziness of the weather they could not so well know how they steered in the daytime as at night, for whenever the North Star appeared they endeavored to keep it on their starboard bow by which means they were certain of making the land some time or other. In the evening two more of the crew died, also before sunset one Thomas Philpot, an old, experienced seaman and very strong. He departed rather convulsed, having latterly lost the power of articulation. His meaning could not be comprehended. He was a native of Belfast, Ireland, and had no family. The survivors found it a difficult task to heave his body overboard, as he was a very corpulent man. Purnell now prevailed upon the captain and boatswain of the boat to lie down in the forepart of the boat to bring her more by the head, in order to make her hold a better wind. 
In the evening the cabin boy, who lately appeared so well, breathed his last, leaving behind the captain, the boatswain, and Mr. Purnell. The next morning, July 17th, Mr. Purnell asked his two companions if they thought they could eat any of the boy's flesh, and having expressed an inclination to try, and the body being quite cold, he cut the inside of his thigh a little above his knee, and gave a piece to the captain and the boatswain, reserving a small piece for himself. But so weak were their stomachs that none of them could swallow a morsel of it, the body was therefore thrown overboard. Early in the morning of the 18th Mr. Purnell found both of his companions dead and cold. Thus destitute he began to think of his own dissolution. Though feeble his understanding was still clear and his spirits as good as his forlorn situation could possibly admit. By the color and coldness of the water he knew he was not far from land, and still maintained hopes of making it. The weather continued very foggy. He lay too all this night, which was very dark, with the boat's head to the northward. In the morning of the 19th it began to rain. It cleared up in the afternoon and the wind died away. Still Mr. Purnell was convinced he was on soundings. On the 20th in the afternoon he thought he saw land and stood in for it, but night coming on and it being now very dark, he lay too, fearing he might get on some rocks and shoals. July 21st. The weather was very fine all the morning, but in the afternoon it became thick and hazy. Mr. Purnell's spirit still remained good, but his strength was almost exhausted. He still drank his own water occasionally. On the 22nd he saw some barnacles on the boat's rudder, very similar to the spawn of an oyster, which filled him with greater hopes of being near land. He unshipped the rudder, and scraping them off with his knife, found they were of a salty fishy substance, and eat them. He was now so weak, the boat having a great motion, that he found it a difficult task to ship the rudder. At sunrise, July 23rd, he became so sure that he saw land that his spirits were considerably raised. In the middle of this day he got up, leaned his back against the mast, and received succor from the sun, having previously contrived to steer the boat in this position. The next day he saw at a very great distance some kind of a sail which he judged was coming from the land, which he soon lost sight of. In the middle of the day he got up and received warmth from the sun as before. He stood on all night for the land. Very early in the morning of the 25th, after drinking his morning draught, to his inexpressible joy he saw, while the sun was rising, a sail, and when the sun was up found she was a two-mast vessel. He was, however, considerably perplexed, not knowing what to do, as she was a great distance astern and to the leeward. In order to watch her motions better, he tacked about. Soon after this he perceived she was standing on her starboard tack, which had been the same he had been standing on for many hours. He saw she approached him very fast, and he lay to for some time till he believed she was within two miles of the boat, but still to leeward. Therefore he thought it best to steer larger when he found she was a topsail schooner nearing him very fast. He continued to edge down towards her until he had brought her about two points under his lee bow, having it in his power to spring his luff or bear away. By this time she was within half a mile, and he saw some of her people standing forwards on her deck, and waving for him to come under their lee bow. At a distance of about two hundred yards they hove the schooner up in the wind, and kept her so until Purnell got alongside, when they threw him a rope, still keeping the schooner in the wind. They now interrogated him very closely. By the manner the boat and oars were painted, they imagined she belonged to a man-of-war, and that they had run away with her from some of His Majesty's ships at Halifax, consequently that they would be liable to some punishment if they took him up. They also thought, as the captain and boatswain were lying dead in the boat, they might expose themselves to some contagious disorder. Thus they kept Purnell in suspense for some time. They told him they had made the land that morning from the masthead, and that they were running along shore for Marblehead, to which place they belonged, and where they expected to be the next morning. At last they told him he might come on board, which, as he said, he could not without assistance. The captain ordered two of his men to help him. They conducted him aft on the quarter-deck, where they left him resting on the companion. They were now for casting the boat adrift, but Mr. Purnell told them she was not above a month old, built at New York, and if they would hoist her in it would pay them well for their trouble. 
To this they agreed, and having thrown the two corpses overboard and taken out the clothes that were left by the deceased, they hoisted her in and made sail. Being now on board, Purnell asked for a little water. Captain Castleman, for that was his name, ordered one of his sons, having two on board, to fetch him some. When he came with the water, his father looked to see how much he was bringing him, and thinking it too much, threw some of it away and desired him to give the remainder, which he drank, being the first fresh water he had tasted for twenty-three days. As he leaned all this time against the companion, he became very cold and begged to go below. The captain ordered two men to help him down to the cabin, where they left him sitting on the cabin deck, leaning upon the lockers, all hands being now engaged in hoisting in and securing the boat. This done, all hands went down to the cabin for breakfast except the man at the helm. They made some soup for Purnell, which he thought very good, but at present he could eat very little, and in consequence of his late draughts he had broke out in many parts of his body, so that he was in great pain whenever he stirred. They made a bed for him out of an old sail, and behaved very attentive. While they were at breakfast a squall of wind came on, which called them all upon deck. During their absence Purnell took up a stone bottle, and without smelling or tasting it, but thinking it was rum, took a hearty draught of it, and found it to be sweet oil. Having placed it where he found it, he lay down. They still ran along shore with the land in sight, and were in great hopes of getting into port that night, but the wind dying away, they did not get in till nine o'clock the next night. All this time Purnell remained like a child. Someone was always with him to give him whatever he wished to eat or drink. As soon as they came to anchor, Captain Castleman went on shore and returned on board the next morning with the owner, John Pickett, Esquire. Soon after they got Purnell into a boat and carried him on shore, but he was still so very feeble that he was obliged to be supported by two men. Mr. Pickett took a very genteel lodging for him and hired a nurse to attend to him. He was immediately put to bed and afterwards provided with a change of clothes. In the course of the day he was visited by every doctor in the town, who all gave him hopes of recovering, but told him it would be some time, for the stronger the constitution, the longer, they said, it took to recover its lost strength. Though treated with the utmost tenderness and humanity, it was three weeks before he was able to come downstairs. He stayed in Marblehead two months, during which he lived very comfortably and gradually recovered his strength. The brig's boat and oars were sold for ninety-five dollars, which paid all his expenses and procured him a passage to Boston. The nails of his fingers and toes withered away almost to nothing, and did not begin to grow for many months after. End of chapter 5 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 6 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 6 The Loss of the Peggy. On the 28th of September, 1785, the Peggy, commanded by Captain Knight, sailed from the harbor of Waterford Island for the port of New York in America. Here it is necessary to observe that the Peggy was a large, unwieldy, Dutch-built ship, about 800 tons burden, and had formerly been in the Norway and timber trade, for which, indeed, she seemed, from her immense bulk, well calculated. There being no freight in readiness for America, we were under the necessity of taking in ballast, which consisted of coarse gravel and sand, with about fifty casks of stores, fresh stock, and vegetables, sufficient to last during the voyage, having plenty of room, and having been most abundantly supplied by the hospitable neighborhood of which we were about to take our leave. We weighed anchor, and with the assistance of a rapid tide and pleasant breeze, soon gained a tolerable offing. We continued under easy sail the remaining part of the day, and towards sunset lost sight of land. September 29th made the old head of Kingsail. The weather continuing favorable, we shortly came within sight of Cape Clear, from whence we took our departure from the coast of Ireland. Nothing material occurred for several days, during which time we traversed a vast space of the western ocean. October 12th, the weather now became hazy and squally. 
all hands turned up to reef topsails and strike top gallant yards towards night the squalls were more frequent indicating an approaching gale we accordingly clued reef topsails and struck top gallant masts and having made all snug aloft the ship weathered the night very steadily on the thirteenth the crew were employed in setting up the rigging and occasionally pumping the ship having made much water during the night the gale increasing as the day advanced occasioned the vessel to make heavy rolls by which an accident happened which was near doing much injury to the captain's cabin a punching of rum which was lashed on the larboard side of the cabin broke loose a sudden jerk having drawn asunder the cleats to which it was fastened by its velocity it stove in the staterooms and broke several utensils of the cabin furniture the writer of this with much difficulty escaped with whole limbs but not altogether unhurt receiving a painful bruise on the right foot having however escaped from the cabin the people on deck were given to understand that the rum was broken loose the word rum soon attracted the sailors attention and this cask being the ship's only stock they were not tardy as may be supposed in rendering their assistance to double lash what they anticipated the delight of frequently splicing the main brace therewith during their voyage on the fourteenth the weather became moderate and the crew were employed in making good the stowage of the stores in the hold which had given way during the night shaking reefs out of the topsails getting up topgallant masts and yards and rigging out studding sails all hands being now called to dinner a bustle and confused noise took place on deck the captain who was below sent the writer of this to discover the cause thereof but before he could explain a voice was crying out in a most piteous and vociferous tone the captain and chief mate jumped on deck and found the crew had got the cook laid on the windlass and were giving him a most severe cobbing with a flat piece of his own firewood as soon as the captain had reached forward he was much exasperated with them for their precipitate conduct in punishing without his knowledge and permission and having prohibited such proceedings in future cases he inquired the cause of their grievance the cook it seems having been served out fresh water to dress vegetables for all hands had inadvertently used it for some other purpose and boiled the greens in a copper of salt water which rendered them so intolerably tough that they were not fit for use consequently the sailors had not their expected garnish and a general murmur taking place the above punishment was inflicted a steady breeze ensuing all sails filled and the ship made way with a lofty and majestic air and at every plunge of her bows which was truly dutch built rose a foam of no small appearance during four days the weather continued favorable which flattered the seamen with a speedy sight of land on the nineteenth we encountered a very violent gale with an unusual heavy sea the ship worked greatly and took in much water through her seams the pumps were kept frequently going at midday while the crew were at dinner a tremendous sea struck the ship right aft which tore in the cabin windows upset the whole of the dinner and nearly drowned the captain mate and myself who was at that time holding a dish on the table while the captain was busily employed in carving a fine goose which much to our discomfiture was entirely drenched by salt water some of the coops were washed from the quarter-deck and several of the poultry destroyed in consequence of the vessel shipping so great a quantity of water the pumps were doubly manned and soon gained on her the gale had not in the least abated during the night the well was plumbed and there was found to be a sudden and alarming increase of water the carpenter was immediately ordered to examine the ship below in order to find the cause of the vessel's making so much water his report was she being a very old vessel her seams had considerably opened by her laboring so much therefore could devise no means at present to prevent the evil he also reported the mizzen mast to be in great danger the heel of the mizzen mast being stepped between decks a very unusual case but probably it was placed there in order to make more room for stowage in the afterhold was likely to work from its step and thereby might do considerable damage to the ship the captain now held a consultation with the officers when it was deemed expedient to cut the mast away without delay this was accordingly put into execution the following morning as soon as the day made its appearance the necessary preparations having been made the carpenter began hewing at the mast and quickly made a deep wound some of the crew were stationed ready to cut away the stays and lanyards 
whilst the remaining part was anxiously watching the momentary crash which was to ensue the word being given to cut away the weather lanyards as the ship gave a lee lurch the whole of the wreck of the mass plunged without further injury into the ocean the weather still threatening a continuance our principal employ was at the pumps which were kept continually going the sea had now rose to an alarming height and frequently struck the vessel with great violence towards the afternoon part of the starboard bulk work was carried away by the shock of a heavy sea which made the ship broach to and before she could answer her helm again a sea broke through the fore chains and swept away the caboose and all its utensils from the deck fortunately for the cook he was assisting at the pumps at the time or he inevitably must have shared the same fate as his galley notwithstanding the exertions of the crew the water gained fast and made its way into the hold which washed a great quantity of the ballast through the timber holes into the hull by which suckers of the pumps were much damaged and thereby frequently choked by such delays the leaks increased rapidly we were under the necessity of repeating hoisting the pumps on deck to apply different means which were devised to keep the sand from entering but all our efforts proved ineffectual and the pumps were deemed of no further utility there was now no time to be lost accordingly it was agreed that the allowance of fresh water should be lessened to a pint a man the casks were immediately hoisted from the hold and lashed between decks as the water was started from two of them they were sawed in two and formed into buckets there being no other casks on board fit for that purpose the whips were soon applied and the hands began bailing at the fore and after hatchways which continued without intermission the whole of the night each man being suffered to take one hour's rest in rotation the morning of the twenty second presented to our view a most dreary aspect a dismal horizon encircling not the least appearance of the gale abating on the contrary it seemed to come with redoubled vigor the ballast washing from side to side of the ship at each roll and scarce a prospect of freeing her notwithstanding these calamities the crew did not relax their efforts the main hatchway was opened and fresh buckets went to work the captain and mate alternately relieving each other at the helm the writer's station was to supply the crew with grog which was plentifully served to them every two hours by the motion of the ship the buckets struck against the combings of the hatchways with great violence and in casting them in the hold to fill they frequently stuck on the floating pieces of timber which were generally used as chocks in stowing the hold by such accidents the buckets were repeatedly stove and we were under the necessity of cutting more of the water casks to supply their place starting the fresh water overboard was reluctantly done particularly as we now felt the loss of the caboose and were under the necessity of eating the meat raw which occasioned us to be very thirsty night coming on the crew were not allowed to go below to sleep each man when it came his turn stretched himself on the deck october twenty third notwithstanding the great quantity of water bailed from the vessel she gained so considerably that she had visibly settled much deeper in the water all hands were now called aft in order to consult on the best measures it was now unanimously resolved to make for the island of bermudas it being the nearest land accordingly we bore away for it but had not sailed many leagues before we found that the great quantity of water in the vessel had impeded her steerage so much that she would scarcely answer her helm and making a very heavy lurch the ballast shifted which gave her a great lift to the starboard and rendered it very difficult to keep a firm footing on deck the anchors which were stowed on the larboard bow were ordered to be cut away and the cables which were on the orlop deck to be hove overboard in order to right her but all this had a very trifling effect for the ship was now becoming quite a log the crew were still employed in bailing one of whom in preventing a bucket from being stove against the combings let go his hold and fell down the hatchway with great difficulty he escaped being drowned or dashed against the ship's sides having got into a bucket which was instantly lowered he was providentially hoisted on deck without any injury during the night the weather became more moderate and on the following morning october twenty fifth the gale had entirely subsided but left a very heavy swell two large whales approached close to the ship they sported around the vessel the whole day and after dusk disappeared 
having now no further use of the helm it was lashed down and the captain and mate took their spell at the buckets my assistance having been also required a boy of less strength whose previous business was to attend the cook now took my former station of serving the crew with refreshments this lad had not long filled his new situation of drawing out rum from the cask before he was tempted to taste it and which having repeatedly done he soon became intoxicated and was missed on deck for some time i was sent to look for him the spigot i perceived out of the cask and the liquor running about but the boy i could not see for some time however looking down the lazaretto the trap-door which was lying open i found him fast asleep he had luckily fallen on some sails which were stowed there or he must have perished on the twenty sixth and twenty seventh of october the weather continued quite clear with light baffling winds a man was constantly kept aloft to look out for a sail the rest of the crew were employed at the whips on the twenty eighth the weather began to lower and appeared inclined for rain this gave some uneasiness being apprehensive of a gale the captain therefore directed the carpenter to overhaul the longboat caulk her and raise a streak which orders were immediately complied with but when he went to his locker for oakum he found it plundered of nearly the whole of his stock all hands therefore were set to picking by which means he was soon supplied it was totally clear on the twenty ninth with a fresh breeze but the ship heeled so much that her gunwale at times was under water and the crew could scarcely stand on deck all hands were now ordered to assemble aft when the captain in a short address pointed out the most probable manner by which they could be saved all agreed in opinion with him and it was resolved that the longboat should be hoisted out as speedily as possible and such necessaries as could be conveniently stowed to be placed in her determined no longer to labor at the buckets the vessel which could not remain above water many hours after we had ceased bailing was now abandoned to her fate i now began to reflect on the small chance we had of being saved twenty-two people in an open boat upwards of three hundred miles from the land in a boisterous climate and the whole crew worn out with fatigue the palms of the crew's hands were already so flayed it could not be expected that they could do much execution with the oars while thus reflecting on our perilous situation one of our oldest seamen who at this moment was standing near me turned his head aside to wipe away a tear i could not refrain from sympathizing with him my heart was already full the captain perceiving my despondency bade me of good cheer and called me a young lover the boat having been hoisted out and such necessaries placed in her as were deemed requisite one of the hands was sent aloft to lash the colors downwards to the main top mast shrouds which having done he placed himself on the cross trees to look around him and almost instantly hallooed out a sail it would be impossible to describe the ecstatic emotions of the crew every man was aloft in order to be satisfied though a minute before not one of the crew was able to stand upright the sail was on our weather bow bearing right down on us with a smart breeze she soon perceived us but hauled her wind several times in order to examine our ship as she approached nearer she clearly perceived our calamitous situation and hastened to our relief she proved to be a philadelphia schooner bound to cape francois in st domingo the captain took us all on board in the most humane and friendly manner and after casting our boat adrift proceeded on his voyage when we perceived our ship from the vessel on which we were now happily on board her appearance was truly deplorable the captain of the schooner congratulated us on our fortunate escape and expressed his surprise that the ship should remain so long on her beam ends in such a heavy sea without capsizing we soon began to distance the wreck by this time very low in the water and shortly after lost sight of her the evening began to approach fast when a man loosing the main topsail descried a sail directly in the same course on our quarter we made sail for her and soon came within hail of her she proved to be a brig from glasgow bound to antigua it was now determined between the captains that half our people should remain in the schooner and the captain mate eight of the crew and myself should get on board the brig on our arrival at antigua we met with much kindness and humanity end of chapter six
Chapter 7 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francisca Powell. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 7 Loss of His Majesty's Ship Litchfield the Litchfield, Captain Burton, left Ireland on the 11th of November, 1758, in company with several other men of war and transports, under the command of Commodore Keppel, intended for the reduction of Goree. The voyage was prosperous till the 28th, when at eight in the evening I took charge of the watch, and the weather turned out very squally with rain. At nine it was extremely dark, with much lightning the wind varying from south-west to west-north-west. At half-past nine, had a very hard squall. Captain Barton came upon deck and stayed till ten, then left orders to keep sight of the Commodore and to make what sail the weather would permit. At eleven, saw the Commodore bearing south, but the squalls coming on so heavy were obliged to hand the main top sail, and at twelve o'clock were under our courses november the twenty ninth at one in the morning i left the deck in charge of the first lieutenant the light which we took to be the commodore's right ahead bearing south wind west south west blowing very hard at six in the morning i was awakened by a great shock and the confused noise of the men on deck i ran up thinking some ship had run foul of us for by my own reckoning and that of every other person in the ship we were at least thirty-five leagues distant from land but before i could reach the quarter-deck the ship gave a great stroke upon the ground and the sea broke all over her just after this i could perceive the land rocky rugged and uneven about two cables lengths from us the ship lying with her broadside to windward the mast soon went overboard carrying some men with them it is impossible for any one but a sufferer to feel our distress at this time the masts yards and sails hanging alongside in a confused heap the ship beating violently upon the rocks the waves curling up to an incredible height then lashing down with such force as if they would immediately have split the ship to pieces which we indeed every moment expected having a little recovered from our confusion saw it necessary to get everything we could over to the hardboard side to prevent the ship from heeling off and exposing the deck to the sea some of the people were very earnest to get the boats out contrary to advice and after much entreaty notwithstanding the most terrible sea one of the boats was launched and eight of the best men jumped into her but she had scarcely got to the ship's stern when she was whirled to the bottom and every soul in her perished the rest of the boats were soon washed to pieces on the deck we then made a raft of the davit capstan bars and some boards and waited with resignation for divine providence to assist us the ship soon filled with water so that we had no time to get any provision up the quarter-deck and poop were now the only place we could stand on with security the waves being mostly spent by the time they reached us owing to the fore part of the ship breaking them at four in the afternoon perceiving the sea to be much abated one of our people attempted to swim and got safe on shore there were numbers of moors upon the rocks ready to take hold of any one and beckoned much for us to come ashore which at first we took for kindness but they soon undeceived us for they had not the humanity to assist any that was entirely naked but would fly to those who had anything about them and strip them before they were quite out of the water wrangling among themselves about the plunder in the meantime the poor wretches were left to crawl up the rocks if they were able if not they perished unregarded the second lieutenant and myself with about sixty-five others got ashore before dark but were left exposed to the weather on the cold sand to preserve ourselves from perishing of cold were obliged to go down to the shore and to bring up pieces of the wreck to make a fire while thus employed if we happened to pick up a shirt or a handkerchief 
and did not give it to the moors at the first demand the next thing was a dagger presented to our breast they allowed us a piece of an old sail which they did not think worth carrying off with this we made two tents and crowded ourselves into them sitting between one another's legs to preserve warmth and make room in this uneasy situation continually bewailing our misery and that of our poor shipmates on the wreck we passed a most tedious night without so much as a drop of water to refresh ourselves excepting what we caught through our sailcloth covering november the thirtieth at six in the morning went down with a number of our men upon the rocks to assist our shipmates in coming ashore and found the ship had been greatly shattered in the night it being now low water many attempted to swim ashore some got safe but others perished the people on board got the raft into the water and about fifteen men placed themselves upon it they had no sooner put off from the wreck than it overturned most of the men recovered it again but scarcely were they on before it was second time overturned only three or four got hold of it again and all the rest perished in the meantime a good swimmer brought with much difficulty a rope ashore which i had the good fortune to catch hold of just when he was quite spent and had thought of quitting it some people coming to my assistance we pulled a large rope ashore with that and made it fast round the rock we found this gave great spirits to the poor souls upon the wreck it being hauled taut from the upper part of the stern made an easy descent to any who had art enough to walk or slide upon a rope with a smaller rope fixed above to hold by this was a means of saving a number of lives though many were washed off by the impetuous surf and perished the flood coming on raised the surf and prevented any more from coming at that time so that the ropes could be of no further use we then retired from the rocks and hunger prevailing set about boiling some of the drowned turkeys etc which with some flour mixed into a paste and baked upon the coals constituted our first meal upon this barbarous coast we found a well of fresh water about half a mile off which very much refreshed us but we had scarcely finished this coarse repast when the moors who were now grown numerous drove us all down to the rocks to bring up empty iron-bound casks pieces of the wreck which had the most iron about them and other articles about three o'clock in the afternoon we made another meal on the drowned poultry and finding this was the best provision we were likely to have some were ordered to save all they could find others to raise a larger tent and the rest sent down to the rocks to look for people coming ashore the surf greatly increased with the flood and breaking upon the fore part of the ship she was divided into three parts the fore part turned keel up the middle part soon dashed into a thousand pieces the fore part of the poop likewise fell at this time and about thirty men with it eight of whom got ashore with our help but so bruised that we despaired of their recovery nothing but the after part of the poop now remained above the water and a very small part of the other decks on which our captain and about a hundred thirty more remained expecting every wave to be their last every shock threw some off few or none of whom came on shore alive during this distress the moors laughed uncommonly and seemed much diverted when a wave larger than usual threatened the destruction of the poor wretches on the wreck between four and five o'clock the sea was decreased with the ebb the rope being still secure the people began to venture upon it some tumbled off and perished but others reached the shore in safety about five we beckoned as much as possible for the captain to come upon the rope as this seemed to be as good an opportunity as any we had seen and many arrived in safety with our assistance some told us that the captain was determined to stay till all the men had quitted the wreck however we still continued to beckon for him and before it was dark saw him come upon the rope he was closely followed by a good able seaman who did all he could to keep up his spirits and assist him in warping as he could not swim and had been so many hours without refreshment with the surf hurling him violently along he was unable to resist the force of the waves had lost his hold of the great rope and must inevitably have perished had not a wave thrown him within the reach of our ropes which he had barely sufficient sense to catch hold of 
We pulled him up, and after resting a short time on the rocks, he came to himself and walked up to the tent, desiring us to continue to assist the rest of the people on coming on shore. The villains, the Moors, would have stripped him, though he had nothing on but the plain waistcoat and breeches if we had not plucked up a little spirit and opposed them, upon which they thought proper to desist. The people continued to come ashore, although many perished in the attempt. The Moors, at length, growing tired with waiting for so little plunder, would not suffer us to remain on the rocks, but drove us all away. I then, with the captain's approbation, went, and by signs made humble supplication to the Basho, who was in the tent, dividing the valuable plunder. He understood us at last, and gave us permission to go down, at the same time sending us some Moors with us. We carried firebrands down to let the poor souls on the wreck see that we were still there in readiness to assist them. About nine at night, finding that no more men would venture upon the rope, as the surf was again greatly increased, we retired to the tent, leaving by the account of the last men arrived between thirty and forty souls still upon the wreck. We now thought of stowing everybody in the tent, and began by fixing the captain in the middle, then made every man lie down on his side, as we could not afford them each a breath, but, after all, many took easier lodging in empty casks. The next morning the weather was moderate and fair. We found the wreck and all in pieces on the rocks, and the shore covered with lumber. The people upon the wreck all perished about one in the morning. In the afternoon we called a muster, and found the number of the survivors to be 220, so that 130 perished on this melancholy occasion. On the 2nd of December, the weather still continued moderate. We subsisted entirely on the drowned stock and the little pork to relish it, and the flour made into cakes, all of which we issued regularly and sparingly, being ignorant whether the Moors would furnish us with anything, they being still very troublesome, and even wanting to rob us of the canvas which covered our tent. At two in the afternoon, a black servant arrived sent by Mr. Butler, a Dane, factor to the African company at Safi at the distance of about thirty miles, to inquire into our condition and to offer us assistance. The man having brought pens, ink and paper, the captain sent back a letter by him. Finding there was one who offered us help, it greatly refreshed our afflicted hearts. In the afternoon of the following day, we received a letter from Mr. Butler, with some bread and a few other necessities. On the 4th, the people were employed in picking up pieces of sails and whatever else the Moors would permit them. We divided the crew into masses and served the necessaries we received the preceding day. They had bread and the flesh of the drowned stock. In the afternoon, we received another letter from Mr. Butler and one at the same time from Mr. Andrews, an Irish gentleman, a merchant at Safi. The Moors were not so troublesome now as before most of them going off with what they had got. On the 5th, the drowned stock was entirely consumed, and at low water and the people were employed in collecting mussels. At 10 in the morning, Mr. Andrews arrived, bringing a French surgeon with medicines and plasters, of which some of the men who had been dreadfully bruised stood in great need. The following day, we served out one of the blankets of the country to every two men, and pampooses, a kind of slippers, to those who were in most want of them. These supplies were likewise brought to us by Mr. Andrews. The people were now obliged to live upon mussels and bread, the Moors, who promised us a supply of cattle, having deceived us and never returned. The people on the 7th were still employed in collecting mussels and limpets. The Moors began to be a little civil to us, for fear the emperor should punish them for their cruel treatment to us. In the afternoon, a messenger arrived from the emperor at Sely, with general orders to the people to supply us with provisions. They accordingly brought to us some lean bullocks and sheep, which Mr. Andrews purchased for us. But at this time, we had no pots to make broth in, and the cattle were scarcely fit for anything else. In the morning of the 10th, we made preparations for marching to Morocco, the emperor having sent orders for that purpose, and camels to carry the lame and necessaries. At nine, set off with about thirty camels, having got all our liquor with us, divided into hogsheads, for the convenience of carriage on the camels. At noon, joined the crews of one of the transports and a bomb tender, 
that had been wrecked about three leagues to the northward of us. We were then all mounted upon camels, excepting the captain, who was furnished with a horse. We never stopped till seven in the evening, when they procured two tents only, which would not contain one-third of the men, so that most of them lay exposed to the dew, which was very heavy and extremely cold. We found our whole number to be 388, including officers, men, boys, three women, and a child, which one of the women brought ashore in her teeth. On the 11th continued our journey, attended by a number of moors on horseback. At six in the evening we came to our resting place for that night, and were furnished with tents sufficient to cover all our men. At five in the morning of the 12th we set out as before, and, at two in the afternoon, saw the emperor's cavalcade in the distance. At three, a relation of the emperor's, named Muli Adris, came to us, and told the captain it was the emperor's orders. He should that instant write a letter to our governor at Gibraltar, to send to his Britannic majesty to inquire whether he would settle a peace with him or not. Captain Barton immediately sat down upon the grass and wrote a letter, which, being given to Muli Adris, he went and joined the emperor again. At six in the evening came to our resting place for the night, and were well furnished with tents, but very little provisions. We were, the following day, desired to continue on the same spot, till the men were refreshed, and this repose the greatly needed, and we received a better supply of provisions. That morning, Lieutenant Harrison, commanding the soldiers belonging to Lord Forbes' regiment, died suddenly in the tent. In the evening, while employed with his internment, the inhuman moors disturbed us by throwing stones and mocking us. The next day we found that they had opened the grave and stripped the body. On the 16th we continued our journey, came to our resting place at four in the afternoon, pitched the tents and served out the provision. Here our people were ill-treated by the country moors. As they were taking water from a brook, the moors would always spit into the vessel before they would suffer them to take it away. Upon this some of us went down to inquire into the affair, but were immediately saluted with a shower of stones. We ran in upon them, beat some of them pretty soundly, put them to flight, and brought away one who thought to defend himself with a long knife. This fellow was severely punished by the officer who had the charge of conducting us. The two succeeding days continued our journey, and, at three in the afternoon on the 18th, arrived at the city of Morocco without having seen a single habitation during the whole journey. Here we were insulted by the rabble, and, at five, were carried before the emperor, surrounded by five or six hundred of his guards. He was on horseback before the gate on his palace, that being the place where he distributes justice to his people. He told Captain Barton, by an interpreter, that he was neither at peace nor at war with England, and he would detain us till an ambassador arrived from the country to conclude a permanent treaty. The captain then desired that we might not be treated as slaves. He answered hastily that we should be taken care of. We were then immediately hurried out of his presence, conveyed to two old ruinous houses, shut up amidst dirt and innumerable vermin of every description. Mr. Butler, being in Morocco on business, came and supplied us with victuals and drink, and procured liberty for the captain to go home with him to his lodgings. He likewise sent some blankets for the officers, and we made shift to pass the night with tolerable comfort, being very much fatigued. At nine in the morning of the 21st, the emperor sent orders for the captain and every officer to appear before him. We immediately repaired to his palace. We remained waiting in an outer yard two hours. In the meantime, he diverted himself with seeing a clumsy Dutch boat rowed about in a pond by four of our pretty officers. About noon we were called before him, and placed in a line about thirty yards from him. He was sitting in a chair by the side of the pond, accompanied only by two of his chief alcaids. Having viewed us some time, he ordered the captain to come forward, and after asking him a good many questions concerning our navy and the destination of the squadron to which we had belonged, we were also called forward by two and three at a time as we stood according to our rank. He then asked most of us some very insignificant questions, and took some to be Portuguese because they had black hair, and others to be Swedes because the hair was light. He judged none of us to be English, excepting the captain, the second lieutenant, 
the ensign of the soldiers, and myself. But destroying him, we were all English, he cried Bono, and gave a nod for our departure, to which we returned a very low bow, and were glad to return to our old ruined houses again. Our total number amounted to thirty. On the 25th, being Christmas Day, prayers were read to the people as usual in the Church of England. The captain this day received the present of tea and loaves of sugar from one of the queens, whose grandfather had been in English renegado. In the afternoon of the 26th, we received the disagreeable intelligence that the emperor would oblige all the English to work, like all the other Christian slaves, excepting the officers who were before him on the 21st. The next day this account was confirmed, for, at seven in the morning, an alcade came and ordered all our people out to work, excepting the sick. Upon our application, eight were allowed to stay at home every day to cook for the rest, and this office was performed by turns throughout the whole number. At four in the afternoon, the people returned, some having been employed in carrying wood, some in turning up the ground with holes, and others in picking weeds in the emperor's garden. The victuals were prepared for them against their return. On the 28th, all the people went to work as soon as they could see, and returned at four in the afternoon. Two of the soldiers received one hundred bastinados each, for having behaving in a disrespectful manner while the emperor was looking at their work. On the 30th, Captain Barton received a kind message from the emperor, with permission to ride out or take a walk in his garden with his officers. From this time, the men continued in the same state of slavery till the arrival, in April, of Captain Milbank, sent as an ambassador to the emperor. He concluded a treaty for the ransom of the crew of the Litchfield, together with the other English subject in the emperor's power, and the sum stipulated to be paid for their release was $170,000. Our people accordingly set out for Salih, attended by a basher and two soldiers on horseback. On the fourth day of their march, they had a skirmish with some of the country moors. The dispute began in consequence of some of our men in the rear stopping at a village to buy some milk, for which, after they had drank it, the moors demanded an exorbitant price. This our men refused to give, on which the moors had recourse to blows, which our people returned, and others coming to their assistance, they maintained a smart battle till the animal became too numerous. In the meantime, some rode off to call the guard, who instantly came up with their drawn scimitars, and dealt round them pretty briskly. During this interval, we were not too idle, and had the pleasure to see the blood trickling down a good many of their faces. The guard seized the chief man of the village, and carried him before the basha, who was our conductor, and who, having heard the cause, dismissed him without further punishment in consideration of his having been well drubbed by us. On the 22nd of April, we arrived at Salih and pitched our tents in an old castle, whence we soon afterwards embarked on board the Gibraltar, which landed us at Gibraltar on the 27th of June. From that place, the captain and crew were put on board the Marlborough storeship, prepared expressly for their reception and arrived in England in the month of August 1760. End of chapter 7. Recording by Francisca Power. Chapter 8 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous Wreck of the Rothsay Castle Steamer The Rothsay Castle was a steam packet which formerly traded on the Clyde. She belonged to the line of steamers which sailed from Liverpool to Beaumaris and Bangor and was furnished with one engine only. She was commanded by Lieutenant Atkinson. At ten o'clock on the of august eighteen thirty one the vessel was appointed to sail from the usual place george's pierhead but a casual delay took place in starting and it was eleven o'clock before she had got everything in readiness whilst taking passengers on board a carriage arrived at the pierhead for embarkation 
it belonged to m w foster esq of regent's park london who with his wife and servant were conveyed in it to the packet and took their passage at the same time they were all subsequently drowned a little dog which accompanied them being the only survivor of this unfortunate group when the steamer left the pierhead her deck was thronged with passengers the captain crew musicians etc amounted to fifteen in addition to whom it was supposed by persons who saw the vessel sail that one hundred and ten or one hundred and twenty souls were on board the majority of the passengers consisted of holy day and family parties chiefly from country places and in one of these companies who came on a journey of pleasure from bury the hand of death committed a merciless devastation it consisted of twenty-six persons in the morning joyous with health and hilarity they set out upon the waves and when the shades of that evening approached every soul but two saw his last of sons go down the weather was not particularly boisterous at the time she sailed a severe storm however had raged in the morning and must have agitated the water on the banks more than usual the wind too blew strongly from the northwest and the vessel had to contend with the tide which began to flow soon after she passed the rock when the steamer arrived off the floating light which is stationed about fifteen miles from liverpool the roughness of the sea alarmed many of the passengers one of the survivors stated that mr terry of bury who with his family consisting of himself his wife their five children and servant was on board being in common with others greatly alarmed for his own safety and the safety of those dear to him went down to the cabin where the captain was at dinner and requested him to put back his reply was i think there is a great deal of fear on board and very little danger if we were to turn back with passengers it would never do we should have no profit to another gentleman who urged him to put back he is reported to have said very angrily i am not one of those that turn back he remained in the cabin two whole hours and peremptorily refused to comply with the repeated requests made to him by the more timid of his passengers to return to liverpool observing that if they knew him they would not make the request before dinner his behaviour had been unexceptionable but after he had dined a very striking difference was observed in his conduct he became violent in his manner and abusive in his language to the men when anxiously questioned by the passengers as to the progress the vessel was making and the time at which she was likely to reach her destination he returned trifling and frequently very contradictory answers during the early part of the voyage he had spoken confidently of being able to reach Beaumaris by seven o'clock but the evening wore away night came on and the vessel was still a considerable distance from the termination of her voyage it was near twelve o'clock when they arrived at the mouth of the munai strait which is about five miles from Beaumaris. the tide which had been running out of the strait and which had consequently for some time previous retarded the steamer's progress towards her destination was just on the turn the vessel according to the statement of two of the seamen and one of the firemen saved had got round the buoy on the north end of the dutchman's bank and had proceeded up the river as far as the tower on puffin island when suddenly the steam got so low that the engine would not keep her on her proper course when asked why there was not steam on the fireman said that a deal of water had been finding its way into the vessel all day and that some time before she got into the strait the bilge pumps were choked the water in the hold then overflowed the coals so that in renewing the fires a deal of water went in with the coals and made it impossible to keep the steam up it was the duty of the firemen to give notice of this occurrence but he seems not to have mentioned it to the captain the vessel which had evidently come fair into the channel though there was no light on the coast to guide her now drifted with the ebb tide and northwest wind towards the dutchman's bank on the north point of which she struck her bow sticking fast in the sand lieutenant atkinson immediately ordered the man at the helm to put the helm a starboard the man refused to do so but put it to port the mate perceiving this ran aft took the helm from the man and put it to starboard again 
in the meantime the captain and some of the passengers got the jib up no doubt he did this intending to wear her round and bring her head to the northward but in the opinion of nautical men it could not make the least difference which way her head was turned as she was on a lee shore and there was no steam to work her off the captain also ordered the passengers first to run aft in the hope by removing the pressure from the vessel's stem to make her float this failing to produce the desired effect he then ordered them to run forward all the exertions of the captain the crew and passengers united were unavailing the ill-fated vessel stuck still faster in the sands and all gave themselves up for lost the terror of the passengers became excessive several of them urged the captain to hoist lights and make other signals of distress but he positively refused to do so assuring the passengers that there was no danger and telling them several times that the packet was afloat and doing well and on her way when the passengers knew perfectly well that she was sticking fast in the sand and her cabins rapidly filling with water doubtless the unfortunate man was perfectly aware of the imminence of the danger but we may charitably suppose that he held such language for the purpose of preventing alarm which might be fatal the alarm bell was now rung with so much violence that the clapper broke and some of the passengers continued to strike it for some time with a stone the bell was heard it is said at Bomaris, but as there was no light hoisted on the mast of the steamer a fatal neglect those who heard the signal were of course ignorant whence it proceeded the weather at this awful moment was boisterous but perfectly clear the moon though slightly overcast threw considerable light on the surrounding objects but a strong breeze blew from the northwest the tide began to set in with great strength and a heavy sea beat over the bank on which the steam packet was now firmly and immovably fixed we cannot describe the scene which followed certain death seemed now to present itself to all on board and the most effective scenes were exhibited the females in particular uttered the most piercing shrieks some locked themselves in each other's arms while others losing all self-command tore off their caps and bonnets in the wildness of despair a liverpool pilot who happened to be in the packet now raised his voice and exclaimed it is all over we are all lost at these words there was a universal despairing shriek the women and children collected in a knot together and kept embracing each other keeping up all the time the most dismal lamentations when tired with crying they lay against each other with their heads reclined like inanimate bodies the steward of the vessel and his wife who was on board lashed themselves to the mast determined to spend their last moments in each other's arms several husbands and wives also met their fate locked in each other's arms whilst parents clung to their beloved children several mothers it is said having perished with their dear little ones firmly clasped in their arms a party of the passengers about fifteen or twenty lowered the boat and crowded into it it was impossible for any open boat to live in such a sea even though not overloaded and she immediately swamped and went to the bottom with all who had made this last hopeless effort for self-preservation for some time the vessel though now irrecoverably lost continued to resist the action of the waves and the despairing souls on board still struggled with their doom but hope had forever fled the packet was beaten and tossed about by the tumultuous waters with a violence which threatened to dash her into fragments at every shock and the sea now made a continual breach over her the decks were repeatedly swept by the boiling ocean and each billow snatched its victims to a watery grave the unfortunate captain and his mate were among the first that perished about thirty or forty passengers were standing upon the poop clinging to each other in hopeless agony and occasionally uttering the most piteous ejaculations whilst trembling thus upon the brink of destruction and expecting every moment to share the fate which had already overtaken so many of their companions in misery the poop was discovered to give way another wave rolled on with impetuous fury and the hinder part of the luckless vessel with all who sought safety in its frail support was burst away from its shattered counterpart and about forty wretched beings hurried through the foaming flood into an eternal world
then rose from sea to sky the wild farewell then shrieked the timid and stood still the brave those who retained any degree of sensibility endeavoured to catch at whatever was floating within their reach with the vain hope of prolonging their lives though it was certain that life could only lengthen their sufferings many grasped with frantic despair at the slightest object they could find but were either too weak to retain their hold or were forced to relinquish their grasp by the raging of the surge the rudder was seized by eight of the sinking creatures at the same time and some of them were ultimately preserved the number of those who clung to the portion of the wreck which remained upon the bank gradually grew thinner and thinner as they sunk under their fatigues or were hurled into the deep by the remorseless waves at length about an hour and a half from the time when she struck the remnant of the rothsay castle disappeared from the bosom of the ocean and the remainder of her passengers and crew were precipitated into the foaming abyss End of chapter eight chapter nine of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous chapter nine shipwreck of the french ship droit de l'homme on the fifth of january seventeen ninety seven returning home on leave of absence from the west indies in the cumberland letter of mark for the recovery of my health saw a large man-of-war off the coast of ireland being then within four leagues of the mouth of the river shannon she hoisted english colours and decoyed us within gunshot when she substituted the tricoloured flag and took us she proved to be les droits de l'homme of seventy-four guns commanded by the c de vont baron now citizen la crosse and had separated from a fleet of men of war on board of which were twenty thousand troops intended to invade ireland on board of this ship was general humbert who afterwards effected a descent into ireland in seventeen ninety nine with nine hundred troops and six hundred seamen on the seventh of january went into bantry bay to see if any of the squadron was still there and on finding none the ship proceeded to the southward nothing extraordinary occurred until the evening of the thirteenth when two men of war hove in sight which afterwards proved to be the indefatigable and amazon frigates it is rather remarkable that the captain of the ship should inform me that the squadron which was going to engage him was sir edward pellows and declared as was afterwards proved by the issue that he would not yield to any two english frigates but would sooner sink his ship with every soul on board the ship was then cleared for action and we english prisoners consisting of three infantry officers two captains of merchantmen two women and forty-eight seamen and soldiers were conducted down to the cabin tier at the foot of the foremast the action began with opening the lower deck ports which however were soon shut again on account of the great sea which occasioned the water to rush in to that degree that we felt it running on the cables i must here observe that this ship was built on a new construction considerably longer than men of war of her rate and her lower deck on which she mounted thirty-two pounders french equal to forty pounders english was two feet and a half lower than usual the situation of the ship before she struck on the rocks has been fully elucidated by sir edward pellow in his letter of the seventeenth of january to mr nepo the awful task is left for me to relate what ensued at about four in the morning a dreadful convulsion at the foot of the foremast roused us from a state of anxiety for our fate to the idea that the ship was sinking it was the foremast that fell over the side in about a quarter of an hour an awful mandate from above was re-echoed from all parts of the ship pouvoir anglais pouvoir anglais montez bien vite nous sommes tout perdus poor englishmen poor englishmen come on deck as fast as you can we are all lost every one rather flew than climbed though scarcely able to move before from sickness 
yet i now felt an energetic strength in all my frame and soon gained the upper deck but what a sight dead wounded and living intermingled in a state too shocking to describe not a mass standing a dreadful loom of the land and breakers all around us the indefatigable on the starboard quarter appeared standing off in a most tremendous sea from the penmark rocks which threatened her with instant destruction to the great humanity of her commander those few persons who survived the shipwreck are indebted for their lives for had another broadside been fired the commanding situation of the indefatigable must have swept off at least a thousand men on the starboard side was seen the amazon within two miles just struck on the shore our own fate drew near the ship struck and immediately sunk shrieks of horror and dismay were heard from all quarters while the merciless waves tore from the wreck many early victims daylight appeared and we beheld the shore lined with people who could render us no assistance at low water rafts were constructed and the boats were got in readiness to be hoisted out the dusk arrived and an awful sight ensued the dawn of the second day brought with it still severer miseries than the first for the wants of nature could scarcely be endured any longer having been already near thirty hours without any means of subsistence and no possibility of procuring them at low water a small boat was hoisted out and an english captain and eight sailors succeeded in getting to the shore elated at the success of these men all thought their deliverance at hand and many launched out on their rafts but alas death soon ended their hopes another night renewed our afflictions the morning of the third fraught with still greater evils appeared our continued sufferings made us exert the last effort and we english prisoners tried every means to save as many of our fellow creatures as lay in our power larger rafts were constructed and the largest boat was got over the side the first consideration was to lay the surviving wounded the women and helpless men in the boat but the idea of equality so fatally promulgated among the french destroyed all subordination and nearly one hundred and twenty having jumped into the boat in defiance of their officers they sunk her the most dreadful of sea that i ever saw seemed at that moment to aggravate our calamity nothing of the boat was seen for a quarter of an hour when the bodies floated in all directions then appeared in all their horrors the wreck the shores the dying and the drowned indefatigable in acts of humanity an adjutant general Renier launched himself into the sea to obtain succors from the shore and perished in the attempt nearly one half the people had already perished when the horrors of the fourth night renewed all our miseries weak distracted and destitute of everything we envied the fate of those whose lifeless corpse no longer wanted sustenance the sense of hunger was already lost but a parching thirst consumed our vitals recourse was had to urine and salt water which only increased the wants half a hogshead of vinegar indeed floated up of which each had half a wine glass it afforded a momentary relief but soon left us again in the same state of dreadful thirst almost at the last gasp every one was dying with misery and the ship now one-third shattered away from the stern scarcely afforded a grasp to hold by to the exhausted and helpless survivors the fourth day brought with it a more serene sky and the sea seemed to subside but to behold from fore to aft the dying in all directions was a sight too shocking for the feeling mind to endure almost lost to a sense of humanity we no longer looked with pity on those whom we considered only as the forerunners of our own speedy fate and a consultation took place to sacrifice some one to be food for the remainder the die was going to be cast when the welcome sight of a man-of-war brig renewed our hopes a cutter speedily followed and both anchored at a short distance from the wreck they then sent their boats to us and by means of large rafts about one hundred out of four hundred who attempted were saved by the brig that evening three hundred and eighty were left to endure another night's misery when dreadful to relate above one half were found dead the next morning i was saved about ten o'clock on the morning of the eighteenth with my brother officers the captain of the ship and general humbert they treated us with great humanity on board the cutter giving us a little weak brandy 
and water every five or six minutes and after that a basin of good soup i fell on the locker in a kind of trance for near thirty hours and swelled to such a degree as to require medical aid to restore my decayed faculties having lost all our baggage we were taken to brest almost naked where they gave us a rough shift of clothes and in consequence of our sufferings and the help we afforded in saving many lives a cartel was fitted out by order of the french government to send us home without ransom or exchange we arrived at plymouth on the seventh of march following to that providence whose great workings i have experienced in this most awful trial of human afflictions be it ever offered the tribute of my praise and thanksgiving End of chapter 9chapter ten of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by betty b thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous the loss of his majesty's ship queen charlotte the queen charlotte was perhaps one of the finest ships in the british navy she was launched in seventeen ninety and her first cruise was with the fleet fitted out against spain in consequence of the dispute respecting nootka sound lord howe who was the commander and chief of the fleet was then on board of her and she also bore his lordship's flag on the first of june after which she was sent to the mediterranean and was the flagship of the commander-in-chief on that station in march eighteen hundred she was dispatched by that nobleman to reconnoitre the island of cabrera about thirty leagues from leghorn then in the possession of the french and which it was his lordship's intention to attack on the morning of the seventeenth the ship was discovered to be on fire at the distance of three or four leagues from leghorn every assistance was promptly forwarded from the shore but a number of boats it appears were deterred from approaching the wreck in consequence of the guns which were shotted and which when heated by the fire discharged their contents in every direction the only consolation that presents itself under the pressure of so calamitous a disaster is that it was not the effect either of treachery or wilful neglect as will appear by the following official statement of the carpenter mr john braid carpenter of the queen charlotte reports that twenty minutes after six o'clock in the morning as he was dressing himself he heard throughout the ship a general cry of fire on which he immediately ran up the after ladder to get upon deck and found the whole half deck the front bulkhead of the admiral's cabin the main mast's coat and boats covering on the booms all in flames which from every report and probability he apprehends was occasioned by some hay which was lying under the half deck having been set on fire by a match in a tub which was usually kept there for signal guns the mainsail at this time was set and almost entirely caught fire the people not being able to come to the clue garnets on account of the flames he immediately went to the forecastle and found lieutenant dundas and the boatswain encouraging the people to get water to extinguish the fire he applied to mr dundas seeing no other officer in the fore part of the ship and being unable to see any on the quarter-deck from the flames and smoke between them to give him assistance to drown the lower decks and secure the hatches to prevent the fire falling down lieutenant dundas accordingly went down himself with as many people as he could prevail upon to follow him and the lower deck ports were opened the scuppers plugged the main and fore hatches secured the cocks turned and water drawn in at the ports and the pumps kept going by the people who came down as long as they could stand at them he thinks that by these exertions the lower deck was kept free from fire and the magazines preserved for a long time from danger nor did lieutenant dundas or he quit this station but remained there with all the people who could be prevailed upon to stay till several of the middle deck guns came through that deck about nine o'clock lieutenant dundas and he finding it impossible to remain any longer below went out at the foremast lower deck port and got upon the forecastle 
on which he apprehends there were then about one hundred and fifty of the people drawing water and throwing it as far aft as possible upon the fire he continued about an hour on the forecastle and finding all efforts to extinguish the flames unavailing he jumped from the jib boom and swam to an american boat approaching the ship by which he was picked up and put in a tartan then in the charge of lieutenant stewart who had come off to the assistance of the ship signed john braid leghorn march eighteenth eighteen hundred captain todd remained upon deck with his first lieutenant to the last moment giving orders for saving the crew without thinking of his own safety before he fell a sacrifice to the flames he had time and courage to write down the particulars of this melancholy event for the information of lord keith of which he gave copies to different sailors entreating them that whoever should escape might deliver it to the admiral thus fell victims to perhaps a too severe duty the captain and his first lieutenant at a time when they still had it in their power to save themselves but self-preservation is never a matter of consideration in the exalted mind of a british naval officer when the safety of his crew is at stake lord keith and some of the officers were providentially on shore at leghorn when the dreadful accident occurred twenty commissioned and warrant officers two servants and one hundred forty two seamen are the whole of the crew that escaped destruction out of nearly nine hundred souls on board that for nearly four hours exerted every nerve to avoid that dreadful termination which too surely awaited them end of chapter ten chapter eleven of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by melvin lee thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous chapter eleven a scene on the atlantic ocean on the morning of the fifth of august eighteen thirty three during a severe gale in latitude forty six longitude thirty one captain dempsey of the ship kingston discovered at a short distance to leeward a brig lying on her beam ends with flag of distress waving captain d instantly bore down towards her when she proved to be the albion of cork crowded with passengers having reached within hail of the unfortunate vessel a heart-rending scene presented itself we beheld says captain dempsey the brig reeling ere she took the farewell plunge witnessed the cool intrepidity of the sailors even at such a moment and listened with feelings the most harrowing to the piercing shrieks of the ill-fated passengers the crew of the kingston flung their best boat into the boiling atlantic but every exertion was vain the angry ocean soon made her its prey the albion went down with every human soul on board end of chapter eleven